there's this structure for the laws of physics um, that we assume the laws exist outside the universe and they're fixed for all time. And, and that was kind of Newton's concept because he believed in sort of an external being that might've written down the laws of nature and actually set the universe in motion. And Darwin is kind of making this argument against that kind of conception of the laws of nature, because when you look at biology, you're constantly seeing change and innovation and creativity in the biosphere right. that you don't, you don't see in gravitating systems or in quantum physics. Um, and so what I'm interested in is what is the structure of that creative process in the universe, the thing that we call life. Um, yeah. And I think it has a very different kind of physics. And in fact, the, the kind of work that I'm doing with my collaborators really suggests that we should think about time as being more fundamental. And some of these other properties is emergent of time in the sense that certain things in the universe don't exist unless other things existed before them. So I would say like mm -hmm. my cell phone is the product of 4 billion years of evolution on earth. They don't spontaneously fluctuate into existence because quantum mechanics tells us they do. That's just, that's a wrong extrapolation of that theory um, to explain the complexity of this object. It actually requires a specific causal chain of information being acquired in the universe about how to build a cell phone, which is what we call the evolution of the biosphere. We're using this phone to communicate with each other at sort of this density and reality of existence. But if we look to something like quantum entanglement or telepathy or remote viewing or all those kinds of things, like you don't actually need the telephone. They just are kind of local to this experience. Yeah. So certain ones of those, I might say I were more reliable phenomena in the sense that you could right. set up experimentally boundary conditions and test it. Um, but I would say a general feature of that kind of thing um, from the, the way that I might talk about that kind of phenomena from the perspective of thinking about living things is um, that they actually are connected by a causal sequence of events. So there is a theory I'm developing with collaborators that we're using for life detection, which is called assembly theory. Um, and um, well, it was first developed for detecting alien life. Um, but the way we think about it um, is actually deeply related to answering your question from the perspective that I think about it, um, which is if you take something like a molecule or a person, um, we would say, um, uh, in this theory that they're an assembly space for a molecule. It's very easy to visualize. So you take a molecule, if you break it in half and you break it in half again and break it in half again, you can get to elementary building blocks and then you can take those and try to reassemble them. So think like Legos, like imagine you have a stack of blue, red and blue yellows, Legos, sorry, red and blue Legos in a stack um, mm -hmm. and you take them apart and then you want to build, find all the ways to be, reassemble that original object. Um, and assembly theory, the way we talk about a molecule is a molecule is actually all of those pathways for building it, but you can't see them unless you actually look at it across time. Um, and this becomes important um, because when you look at that, that let's say you built um, not a, a really simple stack, stack of Legos, which if you had some random kinetic motion, you might maybe expect to spontaneously self-assemble. But let's say you're like my son and you really like Harry Potter and you built like the Hogwarts castle, what's the likelihood of you being able to assemble that object? And this is where we say, you know, the likelihood of that particular configuration is very low. Um, in assembly theory, those more complex objects have longer and longer shortest paths for assembling them. And so we talk about the shortest path to make something as being an intrinsic feature of the object. So, um, and then the argument is that if you had if you see a complex object and it requires too many minimal steps for the universe to produce it, then it's a signature that you had a living process there or something that had information or knowledge about how to make that specific object. Now, this gets important to answering your question, because if I have a set of objects like people, um, what it suggests is they're, they're not independent phenomena. So one of the reasons I was laughing about the idea of a phone spontaneously fluctuating out of the quantum vacuum is I don't think a human could ever emerge in isolation in the universe. They always emerge in groups or populations because there's a set of causal constraints that's actually generating the phenomena we call humans. And they're connected in their past by this set of ways that the universe could make them this sort of assembly space. And you can actually look at the causal constraints in that space and say how likely it is to get this set of objects. So when I think about people, I don't necessarily think about us as individuals. I think of us as sort of um, uh, a lineage of this kind of information structuring matter across time and that we're connected in, in across time in a really interesting 
and fundamental and physical way. And that may manifest. Um, so for example, an entanglement, if you thought time had a physical dimension in the same way that space has a physical dimension, it'd be very easy to say that those things are actually con connected more fundamentally um, in terms of being having been localized in time and space is this emergent property that makes them look like they're separated. And this is something that happens in sort of causal set theories for quantum gravity, the way I talk about it, which is supposed to be one explanation for quantum gravity. But um, so, so, so I guess my, my short answer is, I don't think it's impossible for us to have some understanding and overlap uh, with each other in a sense that even when we speak language, right? Language is a weird thing to think about as a physical object. Like what is a word as a physical thing? Yeah. Uh, and the reason that we can communicate is because we share a common history because mm. we're part of the same lineage. We're, we're part of the same example of life in the universe connected by this causal story of life evolving over 4 billion years. Well, why do they, I mean, I would imagine that this is, this theory is intriguing and could be really powerful is because from all the things that I read and learn about is that people say that in the quantum field or in the universe time, this is a, we're in a time space reality and that in outside of this time space reality, there isn't time anymore and everything exists simultaneously. Yeah. Why, where does that come from? What is the actual science that they're implying when they say that time does not exist? The thing that I think people have a hard time grasping of about physics, and this is even true for practicing physicists and some of the best physicists in the world, is that physics is, you know, a set of theories that describe to best approximation certain phenomena we see in the world, and they can suggest features of our reality that are imperceptible to us. Like, for example, the fact that I'm sitting in a curved uh, space-time uh, geometry right now because I'm a massive body attracted to another massive body, right? Like that's, I, I can't perceive that with my sensory perception, but I can infer that based on being an intelligent being. I think the, the thing is like, how far can we extrapolate the theories? And, and then the question I have related to that is, when do you decide that your extrapolation is non-physical? And I, th because it doesn't conform to other features that you observe that maybe you don't have an explanation for. And the places where you see this come up mo most clearly are where say fundamental physics interacts with everyday experience or intuition. Um, and there are real conflicts there. Like, you know, people that study um, physics and want to, you know, explain everything in terms of the structure of the standard model will say there's no room for free will because the standard model explains everything uh, because it explains what your elementary particles are doing. So therefore you and I don't exist. We're just epiphenomena. And I, I don't think, um, I don't think that's adequate because it, it doesn't explain a lot of features of our experience. And so the point about time is there are certain models of the universe that time doesn't exist. And in standard physics, time needs to be an emergent property. Um, it's not a fundamental property. Um, and so, so what people do um, is they, they spend a lot of time trying to show how time emerges from fundamental physics. Um, and some of the places that might come up are thinking about, um, you know, entropy, like the increase in disorder of the universe has a certain directionality to it, mm -hmm. um, or, um, you know, actually having a process be irreversible in, in an entropic sense. So, so these are, these are certain ways of trying to show that there should be a directionality in time, but there's also other senses you could think about time. There's the flow of time, which is our perception of time. So that's mm -hmm. psychological. And then when I talk about time, I actually mean the ordering of events that can happen, mm -hmm. um, which is another concept of time. And when, when I was talking about this sort of idea of thinking of ourselves as these assembly structures, like these, these causal structures of, you know, like I, I exist in the universe in, in sort of theory we're thinking about um, as all of the ways the universe could assemble Sarah. I'm a unique object in the universe, but I, I contain a lot of uh, baggage, if you will, but like a lot of history, right? I'm a, you know, I, I, I've been, I've been generated in this universe over 4 billion years of evolution of life on earth. Um, and, um, and time becomes fundamental when you're thinking about that, because there is a clear ordering that, um, you know, I couldn't be born before my grandmother. It's a, it's a causal impossibility. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's some paradoxes in, in relativity associated with that, that get resolved by certain features of that theory. But I think what, 
when I think about relativity, I don't think about relativity as being a theory that actually talks about time. I think it's a theory that talks about simultaneity. And I think part of the problem with all of these concepts is we're all using the same words, but words are imprecise to reality. And we, we slightly construe them based on our perceptions of what we think they mean. And then we get in these kind of, uh, narratives where people are using the same words in different ways, and then it becomes very confused what's happening. Um, and that happens in science among, you know, some of the best experts in the world don't always know what each other are talking about when they use certain words like time or space. Well, space is a little bit easier. Space is actually much easier. Um, but then, you know, when we talk about it popularly, it also becomes, uh, you know, quite different. And, and I think it's important to be aware of the fact that when you're working on the boundary, that some of these concepts may not really be understood in the way that we think we understand them. Mm -hmm.